Leopard meets Mongoose. Mongoose magic moments. The Tsabokalodi yellow mongoose group. Hello out there, mongoose conservation friends. I hope you're all very well. This is a very rare encounter where I was out walking with Tsabokalodi yellow mongoose group here in the Meerkat Magic Valley Reserve of the Meerkat Magic Conservation Project just before sunset. It's a very windy day today, but that hasn't stopped it from getting really hot. The temperatures have been averaging over 45 degrees centigrade. So this lovely cooling breeze late afternoon is wonderful. And because it's been so hot, one of the resident Gershalone pardalises, leopard tortoise, which is a very large specimen, it looks to be a female, is out moving away from one of the burrows. Tortoises commonly also share burrows with yellow mongooses and of course the Ungulungu meerkats also in this area and that is why I call these burrows wildlife hotels because they have many different rooms and chambers but the inhabitants do not share the same room or chamber just the same structure and this is incredible this is so so rare to actually be in the same place at the same time as these two reserve species and you can just see how relaxed the tortoise is because this is part of the neighborhood watch yellow mongoose right here keeping a guard who recognizes me since I've been following this family group of mongooses since 2008 with many many generations and this is the current dominant female Gakulu the dominant male Giabonga which is thank you Gakulu is very much so together they form thank you very much in Zulu one of the local languages in South Africa. We do have 11 official languages in the country, the last I checked. What a magnificent species. Look at this ancient tortoise. This one is probably at least 60 or 70 years old, and judging by the growth rings on its shell, we can actually get an idea of this. Beautiful, and of course it is a protected animal, as are all the others on this reserve of mine. What a treat to be able to see Tsabokalodi yellow mongoose foraging and to come across this beautiful leopard tortoise. Magnificent. There's a reason why I call this mongoose magic moments because it is indeed incredible to be able to share moments with wild animals getting snapshots into their actual lives. These are wild animals. They are completely unhandled, they're not fed, they're not marked, they don't have radio telemetry. To gain this kind of selective trust, which is not taming an animal, because they won't allow anyone else near them who doesn't know the recognized calls and hand gestures. Brrr, brrr. And it is getting fairly late, it's just going on sunset, so although yellow mongooses are diurnal you'll also find them active at dusk and dawn so they're also crepuscular and i have seen them active at three o'clock in the morning as well so they are also nocturnal they're highly adaptable and they have a horizontally slitted pupil which allows variable light to allow them to see amazingly well in harsh light or when there's very little light available at all. The white tip to the tail is a characteristic of an animal that can be active at night. Again, meerkats have the black tip to the tail. They are completely diurnal. She's keeping a vigilant eye out, even though the tortoise is being relaxed and moving along. Because as I mentioned, they are all part of the neighborhood watch. If something happens to one species, they will alarm. And the others that have grown up with these other species, tortoises, yellow mongooses, meerkats, porcupine, ant bear, and all the myriad of other species that occur in the reserve, they will all react. And everybody benefits from this shared vigilance. In my book, Meerkats, published in 2016 internationally, you can find it anywhere in the world, do a search for it on Amazon, Meerkats by Grant McIlrath, the Meerkat Man. And you will find there's a poem in there which is called The Neighborhood Watch, Silent Call. 
It's about the cicada, which is an insect in this area that I call the bush thermometer because it starts making a very loud, whinging, whiny sound that many people are familiar with around the world where they have these insects. And then when the sound stops, it's the loudest alarm of all because everybody becomes alert. Meerkats will stop what they're doing and stand up and look around. Antelope will stop, look around. Birds will stop calling and look around. Yellow mongooses, and the list goes on and on and on, all from an insect. So that's just one of the myriad of senses that are vigilant in this area. Look at this beautiful tank walking along. Again, it is not a good idea to handle tortoises that you come across because we don't know if we might give them some kind of an infection that we might be immune to, but they are not. So interspecies diseases or anything like that. And it's also not a good idea to move them into a different area. You may think you are helping them, but in fact, you could actually be bringing them out of their territory because they are territorial. They could have spent decades, such as this one here, moving around an area that they're familiar with. Also, the other very unfortunate incident that often happens is people pick up tortoises and they turn them on the sides and then the tortoise as a self-defense mechanism will release any water or food that it is carrying and that can also lead to dehydration and even death. So if you do move them off a road, very gently lifting them, do not tilt them to the side and do not move them anywhere else, just across to protect them from any oncoming traffic, as an example there. What a lucky sighting. All right, I'm going to be moving back to Tsebokolodi group now, who are heading to the burrow. See if I can find the dominant male in a moment. Ah, there's a bit of an auto groom happening, a bit of back leg scratching to get rid of any of the sticky grasses in this area, which is an ecological benefit known as epizoocori, sea dispersal externally. And you get endozoocori internally, anemocore, hydrocore. Anemo is wind dispersal of seeds, hydrocore, water dispersal, sauricori from reptiles such as the beautiful one that just walked past a moment ago, ornithocori from birds, internal, external, seeds that get stuck on their beaks, seeds that pass through their digestive systems have a better chance of germinating, Merimecocori, seed dispersal by ants. In fact, that is such an incredible aspect of survival of many of the species in these areas which are also prone to fire hazards because we are part of the Cape Floristic region. As you can see by the massive great black mountain ranges dwarfing this valley, they often get covered in snow. But they have Machia, which is the less commonly known English name for Feinbos, F-Y-N-B-O-S, Feinbos, Proteas, Ericas, Leucospermans, etc. Many of these species only grow under specific fire conditions, so they do need to actually have fire in order to germinate. And other species in these areas can die out if they get burned. But the ants eat the eliosum on the seed. It's a waxy layer. And then they take the seed underground so it can germinate and avoid being burned. So that is known as convergent evolution in science or convergent development, where different species actually benefit from one another so greatly that they become interdependent on one another. All right, just a little bit of info as I'm busy following this beautiful female as she heads towards a sleeping area way off in the distance. It's one of my favorite times of the day to be out just before and just after sunset. Oh, there's a bit of scent marking. As you notice briefly, the tail was lifted there. I'm wearing the same old beaten up shoes to this particular yellow mongoose group because they do scent mark these shoes. They do recognize my scent. I don't wear these shoes to any other study areas. Just the same as I did in the Kalahari back in 1993, working with the meerkat groups up there. Ah, 
I have different shoes for different study areas because there's an entire scent network out here the occasional glances at me and my moving of the hand like this is just a recognized signal my calls and of course my voice are very familiar to this particular group and of course this individual and it's important to be able to be heard even through dense vegetation where I cannot be seen easily and if an animal is looking at me because I may have disturbed them in any way I can simply make a gesture which they recognize which is a visual reassurance this is all NLP neuro linguistic programming animal psychology basically it's associative learning in action interspecies communication all right another scent mark have to be quick to pick up this kind of data just the raising of the tail very briefly unlike the meerkats yellow mongooses against the nictus penicillata the scientific for the species do have middens communal toilets latrines meerkats will just basically dig a little hole and deposit their dung and urine all around their territory not usually in specific areas like the mongooses do here and on this property we have a number of different species of mongooses. Probably one of the best places on the planet to see this number of species, including the meerkat up close. Yellow mongoose, Cape gray mongoose, the large gray, also known as the Egyptian mongoose, the water mongoose. All occur here. Herpestes ichneumon, incidentally, the Egyptian mongoose is on par with Herpestes species that are not usually seen as gregarious animals. All right, I've just been distracted briefly here. Uh, this is a bit of porcupine dung, this area. There are lots of scent marks coming in here. Albicorda white-tailed mongoose and the Egyptian mongoose are over a meter long so all right it's very very dense vegetation but you can see how Gakulu just fades into the vegetation of course I use African theme names for all the study animals I work with because when I discuss them with anybody they can find it a lot more enjoyable to hear that's an alarm puffed up tail just like a cat Pilo erecting the hair it's a scent disturbance we're getting close to the burrow, so she's been extra vigilant. Another scent mark. An SMS, as I call it. Scent short message system. Wildlife tech is way ahead of human tech. They've been doing this always. An example, I'm disturbing the vegetation here, so in order to disguise it, the scraping and crunching sounds which I don't ever want the wild animals I work with to become familiar with because they never ignore it when a predator makes those warning signs and then they have a better chance of getting caught that's when animals get tamed and that is the difference between ethical tolerance gained through years of very selective associative trust and simply taming an animal which is extremely easy to do and unfortunately many unethical scientists have done it and continue to do it it's a shortcut and it doesn't take the animal into account all right we're getting close to the burrow i'm going to keep filming now on this little point of view walk through and as i move through the area i am disguising my footprint sounds with the sound of my voice overlaying it at this particular burrow i have got a little fence line which many animals recognize and they don't move through it but they can move under it easily but it's for cattle or any other larger species to avoid trampling the burrow system it is a very common behavior for various animals to do that and it can destroy an entire wildlife hotel sheep are notorious for doing this in the kalahari for example where they will go and eat the various salts and things minerals that come out from deep beneath the ground from the burrows there they dig them up and they'll roll on burrows and destroy them and many times the animals who live in the burrows are trapped underneath and will die 
So any stock farmers out there who watch this, it is a very easy thing to do just to erect a little stock fence around burrow systems on your property that will protect the inhabitants from any stock disturbing these burrows, which could be hundreds of years old because they are inherited from one generation of wildlife to the next. We know, the, know this with meerkats, for example, and in my studies for decades with yellow mongooses too, I have been able to see this is the case. You can see how incredibly well Gakulu fades into the vegetation. It's just that little white tip to her tail, which is keeping low down to the ground as she moves along. When meerkats move through dense vegetation, their tails are held vertically, and the black tip to the tail is very easy to see. Right, she's going into the different burrow entrances here all around us. There are dozens. When I started studying this particular family group, there wasn't even an acacia karoo, this indigenous thorn tree that occurs here. It didn't exist. It's taken many, many years. This is a oh, 17-year-old tree now. I've seen many generations of yellow mongoose born beneath this tree. All right, she may come up in a bit. There she is. Many of these burrows are interconnected for safety reasons, of course. If an animal goes into one, it can get out from another. And they know exactly where everything is, and they will scent mark everything, just like meerkats do, to make sure it's safe to go into the burrow. All right, she's scent marking, checking the area, looking for her mate, who could be in the area as well. I don't see him at the moment. Brrrr. All right, I'm going to sign off there. I hope you all stay well, wherever you are in the world, my friends. Until next time, all the very best. Friends, thank you for watching. Please do like and subscribe and share this video on social media. It really helps my channel and it helps conservation awareness. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.